everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I didn't verify pronunciation with you, but today our speaker is Dana Staff. Staff? Staff. I knew the Dana because you said it's like banana, right? Right. <laughs> um, Dana is in, fell in love with cephalopods at the age of 10. She began to keep them as pets in a home aquarium, learned to scuba dive in order to meet more of them in the wild, and eventually completed a PhD on squid at Stanford University's Hopkins Marine Station. Her first book, Squid Empire, The Rise and Fall of the Cephalopods, was named one of the best science books of 2017 by NPR Science Friday. She lives in San Jose, California, and works as a freelance science writer and educator. And we can't sell her book here, but ask her about it afterwards. I'm sure you could get a copy. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming and eating pizza and then also staying very kindly um, to listen now that your tummies are full. Um, and I am so happy to be here, uh, kind of a return to my Monterey Bay roots. Um, as was mentioned in my introduction, I did, I was minted as a PhD student just down the coast at Hopkins in Monterey. And I thought what I'd do, since I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be weaving two subjects together today. I'm going to tell you the story of squid evolution, um, which is my favorite story right now. And I'm also going to talk a lot about science communication and how I went from being a practicing scientist to being primarily a practicing science communicator and giving you some ideas um, of things that if you're interested in trying, you might want to try yourselves or just kind of share that story for those who are interested. Um, so I'll introduce myself first and then I'll introduce the squid and then we'll just have this nice interleaved talk. We'll see how it goes, sort of like a, a jet cycle where you fill and then, yeah, it's a good. Maybe that's not a good metaphor, I'll work on it. So I, I did my PhD down at Hopkins. I spent a lot of time in the field. Um, I spent a lot of time in the lab. I also spent a lot of time behind the computer looking at really boring sequence data. Um, and at the end of six years of all of this, I wrote this dissertation called Reproduction and Early Life of the Humboldt Squid, um, which was sort of a <coughs> doorstopper, as those of you who have also written dissertations are familiar with. Um, and it's pretty boring, but it's mostly about this little fellow, which is a baby Humboldt squid. I worked primarily on Humboldt squid, primarily on this early life stage. What do they eat? Where do they live? How do they live there? Um, and then how do the grown-ups make more of them? So I usually just tell people I studied squid sex and babies for my PhD, which is a pretty good conversation starter. Um, so then, after graduate school, I, got, I had gotten so interested in science communication of all different varieties while I was a student that I just declared myself a freelance science communicator, primarily a science writer. And that eventually led me to writing an entire book called Squid Empire, The Rise and Fall of the Cephalopods. And uh, this is what you might call extreme science communication. Writing a book is kind of an insane endeavor. It takes over your entire life for a few years. For a while, your bed looks like this, and you can't sleep until you've finished reorganizing the entire structure of your book from beginning to end. And um, it's, you know, it's extreme science communication. It's not something I would necessarily recommend. But over the course of doing this kind of science communication, writing a popular science book, I realized something which is that I've actually been a science communicator ever since I was a little kid. And I bet that many or all of you have been as well. If you ever came home from school or surfaced from a book or from the library and said over the dinner table, hey, mom, did you know that there are parasites that live exclusively on fish tongues? Um, and then that it made everybody's appetite improve at the dinner table. And then, uh, you know, maybe in college you would be going for a romantic drive with your boyfriend and you just wouldn't be able to contain yourself and you'd say, hey baby, did you know that there are parasites that live forever entwined inside the livers of their hosts and it's just the most romantic thing. And then you, that's sort of a litmus test for the relationship and you see which way it goes. Uh, but these sorts of things that all of us do as people who love science, who practice science, who read about science, we're all, we can't help ourselves. We're all science communicators on a day-to-day -day casual basis. Um, and so what I thought I would talk about while I'm talking about the squid evolution are all of the additional kinds of science communication that can be practiced that aren't necessarily writing a whole book, um, but are sort of additional and on top of the dinner table 
casual drive conversation that we're all already doing. And the one of these that I thought I would start with, because it's something that most of us do at some point when we're academics, when we're students or teachers, is teaching. Um, teaching in the classroom, whether you're actually lecturing or you're working as a teaching assistant or you're leading labs, and teaching younger students as well. This is, this is um, are a couple of different programs that I was involved with starting when I was at Hopkins, Squids for Kids and Ocean Heroes, where we worked with K-12 students. And sometimes we brought them to Hopkins and sometimes we took them out into the intertidal tide pooling, um, and sometimes we gave them enormous squid to dissect and showed them how to take out the pens and puncture the ink sac and write thank you with it, um, which is what's happening up here. They sent us this photo um, because we had actually mailed this squid to a school across the country and, uh, and given them advice for how to dissect it and everything. And so this is the sort of science communication that I think comes really easily to a lot of us because it's an extension, an extension of that, hey, this is really cool, I wanna tell people about it. And then you just get to tell them. And the people that you're telling are students or children who are often really excited to learn whatever it is that we want to tell them. Um, and there are probably, a lot of you are probably already doing outreach. Um, I'm curious how many people are involved or have been involved with K-12 outreach. Um, so that's already like at least half of the room. It's, it's something that's really easy to do in a way. You know, it, it can take a lot of outlay, a lot of time to, pre to prep for it, to do it. Um, but it's really rewarding. And one of the things that I like so much about it, um, and it's something that I still do, um, my daughter's in school now, so they actually can't keep me out of the classroom. Uh, and I'm always there bringing squid in and doing cool things and, uh, or, you know, incredibly not cool things, but they tolerate it. And the thing that I love about it is that this energy from students and children helps us often, helps me often, to get a new perspective on the science and to ask the sorts of questions that let me really integrate different fields and think about things in a new way. And this is kind of what happened as I was on the journey towards writing a book about squid evolution, cephalopod evolution, is that I started wondering what makes a cephalopod. This is the sort of question that you might ask a group of students or of children, and the things that they'll tell you are the things that most people think of if they ever think of cephalopods at all. Um, but if they think of octopus and squid, often tentacles are one of the first things that come up. Um, camouflage, their amazing ability to blend in with the background. There is, in fact, cuttlefish here, right in the middle of the sand. Ink, they squirt ink, that's pretty cool. Not a lot of animals do that. And then of course, last but not least, their amazing intelligence. This is really what captured me as a child. I was 10 years old when I fell in love with cephalopods. And I think that a lot of us, children or adults, really connect to this intelligence in an animal so different from us. Watching it solve puzzles and go through mazes and play with toys in a way that feels familiar and yet extremely alien. And these are all of the things that we think of that make a cephalopod. And then I realized that none of them are what originally made cephalopods. When this group first evolved, they had no ink, they probably had no tentacles, they did not have any camouflage. What they had that made them unique, that makes them recognizable in the fossil record is a shell a very specific kind of shell that is buoyant. And this is not a fossil shell. This is a shell from a living cephalopod called a nautilus, which is the only living member of the group that still has this external chambered buoyant shell. Each one of these walls here, this is, this shell has been sliced in half. So each one of these walls uh, sections off part of the shell that can then be filled with gas which holds the animal neutrally buoyant. It sort of offsets the weight of the shell and helps them achieve neutral buoyancy in the water. And the fact that this was the original innovation of cephalopods, and yet it's all but lost and forgotten today, really blew my mind. And it got me digging deeper and deeper into the cephalopod evolution story. And so I'm gonna bring us all the way back to where it started, long before humans, uh, long before dinosaurs, and long before anything even lived on land, with the exception of some single-celled algae. So I must apologize to any phycologists in the audience, um, because I do tell people that everything interesting was happening in the ocean. I know there were some interesting things happening on land. I'm sorry. But all of the big stuff was happening in the ocean, all of the animal evolution, all of the macroscopic stuff. 
mostly trilobites. But all of the other animals that evolved in the Cambrian explosion, your early echinoderms, early mollusks, they're all living on and around the seafloor. Everything was grubbing or burrowing or scuttling. Uh, there was very little up in the water column. There were a few little swimmers that still stayed pretty close to the bottom, um, and everything was rooted down or scuttling around, including all of the early mollusks, which include the very first cephalopods, of which this is a drawing of one, believed to be a putative early cephalopod. And the way we know is by looking inside the fossil shell. So here is the first step. This is the creation of cephalopods, the evolution of cephalopods. Um, sorry, it's not a good word to use, but I, what I mean is the, the cephalopods as they arose from the ancestral mollusk began with secreting these little bits of shell to seal off chambers. And part of the body extends up through those chambers, and it's that little tube of flesh that slowly extracts the liquid from the chambers, allowing gas to diffuse in. And once enough gas diffuses in, the animal is lifted off of the seafloor and becomes a pelagic animal. It's no longer one of these many benthic animals, but it really is one of the first truly pelagic animals. And in addition to getting up into the water column, this allowed them to get really big. Uh, these straight-shelled cephalopods here, you can see this one is extending off the screen probably about this far, are reconstructed from early fossils. And they were the first really big animals that evolved on Earth, period, because there was nothing on land. This is way before dinosaurs, marine reptiles, ichthyosaurs. Um, there were not actually scuba divers at the time. But, uh, but this, this is a real figure from a journal article, and they put the, the scuba diver in just to show you, like, yes, these are massively larger than any human. Um, and so they were the world's first sea monsters, the world's first monsters. Um, this is Camaroceras, one of those early straight-shelled cephalopods from the Ordovician, which is right after the Cambrian, um, 470 million years ago. Definitely the top animals there. We don't really know how predatory they were. They were some combination of predatory and scavenging, for sure. They were not fast swimmers, but nobody else was either, so it was fine. Uh, they were stately swimmers. They sort of floated along like these dirigibles, um, just picking up whatever they wanted from the seafloor. And this ability to get really big with a buoyant shell lasted for 400 million years, because here we have these giant ammonites from the late Cretaceous. So these guys are living at the same time as Tyrannosaurus and T. rex are on land. And they're growing enormous shells too. By now they've been started to grow coiled shells because of interesting evolutionary conflicts and the need to get a little bit more um, streamlined, a little bit less awkward <laughs> as you're swimming through the water. Um, but they're still getting enormous. And so this, this part of the story, I just stopped and I was like, they are, the original monsters. Why are they not the ones that Jurassic Park is about? Why is this movie not about ammonites? Uh, you know, why is this one not about vellum knights um, and Camaroceras and all of the other fantastic cephalopod monsters that existed? Um, not to mention like all of the dinosaur everything else, all the dinosaur video games and coloring books and you name it. Um, like, to be a parent is to be inundated with dinosaur regalia, which is great. Uh, in a way, I feel like it's a total triumph of science communication because dinosaurs are super obscure. They're not even around anymore. The only reason we know about them is science. Um, and you know, three-year-olds know about them. You know, my two-year-old wanders around the house going, where'd my ankylosaurus? Whenever he loses his rubber ankylosaurus, which is fantastic, which is all the time. Uh, so we should tie it to him with a string probably. So I think that what it was important to understand this triumph and how to replicate it is that dinosaurs themselves have not always been so popular, so known. Um, some of you may have heard of something called the dinosaur renaissance that happened in the last century because before that, dinosaurs were thought to be really slow, really stupid, and pretty boring. Uh, it was thought that they went extinct because they were so slow and stupid and boring. And it wasn't until John Ostrom and Bob Backer um, and other scientists in the 60s and 70s started to describe the, this new view of dinosaurs as 
related to modern birds, as active with social behaviors, uh, with feathers, warm-bloodedness, that people started to be like, oh, dinosaurs, they're actually pretty cool. Um, it was this view of dinosaurs that was called the dinosaur renaissance that started in the 70s, gained a lot of traction in the 80s, led to the Jurassic Park franchise and all of the, the dinosaur love that's so entrenched in our culture today. So knowing that this happened with dinosaurs, um, this is my, my new thesis that I'm going around trying to spread the good word that cephalopods can be the new dinosaurs. Uh, that's time for a cephalopod renaissance. And this is, you know, once I latched onto this as my mantra, um, it's a great thing to go out into the public and give talks about. Um, this is where my presentation gets sort of meta because here I am giving a talk about cephalopods as the new dinosaurs and I'm going to talk about all of the ways you can give talks about things. Uh, and all of the places that you can give talks. Moss Landing is of course a wonderful place to give talks. Thank you for having me, Moss Landing. Um, other wonderful places to give talks uh, that are relatively nearby. The Bay Area Science Festival happens every year. Um, some of you may have been involved with it in past years. They're always looking for partners, looking for people with cool stories to tell. So, um, so I've talked there about cephalopods as the new dinosaurs. Um, something that not a lot of scientists I have met know about, but should know about, is Nerd Night, uh, which is something that different cities all over the world host. There's one in San Francisco, there's one in the East Bay, there's even one in the South Bay that's a little more irregular. But um, most of the time they happen every month and they're at a bar, and there's a really rowdy but really excited audience that wants to hear about everything. And so the people who organize them bring in experts from, um, from city treatment plants, because people are excited about that, or experts in bed bug eradication, um, or people talking about cephalopods as the new dinosaurs. So this is another place that I've had a lot of success and a lot of excitement from the audience giving this talk. Um, libraries are also fantastic. Um, I've given, gave a talk recently at the South San Francisco Library because they just happened to be one who reached out to me, but there are libraries all over the place, always excited to have speakers come. The Seymour Marine Discovery Center, just up the coast a little ways, has their Science Sunday series, which many of you probably um, have, have spoken at, have attended, uh, but it's a great place. I've given a couple of talks there as well. And then um, the last one I'm going to mention is the Cal Academy of Sciences up in San Francisco has nightlife, um, which is again an adult audience slightly boozed up depending on when in the evening your talk is given. Uh, very excited and interested to learn about whatever you have to say. Um, and these are just a few places that I have experience with, but um, I'm sure many of you probably know other places as well. And it's always worth reaching out if you feel like you have a cool story to share and getting an audience. That said, I know that getting up in front of an audience is not everybody's cup of tea, not everybody is a total diva like me, and then there are options like podcasts, uh, which are in some ways even better because these podcasts are recorded, can be listened to live or remotely. There's no limit to the size of your audience. People can listen to them while they're jogging, while they're pipetting. Many of you probably listen to podcasts while you're pipetting. Um, and there are a lot of cool science podcasts, more and more every day. They're just, they're, I haven't done quite as many of these as public talks, but there's two that I thought I would do a plug for. Probably Science was a really fun one. This is a couple of comedians in Hollywood that started this podcast. One of them said because he got a BS in some science and he didn't want his parents to think he'd wasted his degree being a comedian, so he's like, oh, I'll start this podcast. Um, and this was a fun one to be involved with because they're, they're located in Hollywood and a friend put me in touch with them when I happened to be in Pasadena for the WSN conference this last fall. And I just rode over to their place and they have this whole studio set up and we had a great chat about squid evolution and hermaphroditic flatworms and just kind of whatever came up and it's continued to be kind of a popular thing to be able to share with people, to hear feedback from people asking me questions based on this podcast that they heard. And it's another neat thing to remember when we are traveling, whether it's for work, for a conference, or even for fun, if you feel like you wanna get your science communication on, it's often worth looking around and seeing if there's a library, a school, or a podcast in the area being like, hey, I'm a visiting scientist, and then they like to get you while you're there. Uh, and then next week, I'm going to do a local Bay Area hosted podcast, Inquiring Minds, 
with, um, with Kishore, Kishore Hari, who is also one of the masterminds behind the Bay Area Science Festival. So I'm excited about this. Um, these are also just great things you can look up to learn about different science around. And my experience with doing podcasts, with doing public lectures, is that you want to have a cool hook, a cool title that will get people excited and wanting to host you and wanting to come and listen to your talk. And then also, it really helps if your story has a lot of drama. And a lot of science stories do have a lot of drama. And if you find it and know where your drama is, um, never be shy about it. Of course, in the case of cephalopod evolution, it's the same as the dinosaur drama. There was a big, oh, and I just wanted to suggest you could always start your own podcast. That's not something I've tackled yet, but it would be a very fun thing to do. Um, in the case of cephalopod and dinosaur evolution, there was a big asteroid that smacked into the Earth, and everything went extinct, kablooey, one really bad day. And I think that this is honestly one of our favorite things about dinosaurs. Um, it's certainly a lot of kids I've talked to, it's their favorite thing about dinosaurs, is that they all went extinct. It's like a murder mystery. What happened to them? Where did they go? And then you find out that they didn't all go extinct and we still have birds. And then it kind of makes it an even better murder mystery because you're like, why didn't they all go extinct? Why did these birds squeak through? Did they have a pact with the meteor or something that let them, um, let them see? I don't think that happened, but it is still an active area of research. So uh, new hypotheses welcome, I'm sure. And squid, of course, also squeaked through to the point that when we think of cephalopods today, we think of only the living ones. Sort of like when we think of birds, we think of birds that are alive, but really remembering that birds are part of the whole dinosaur clade. So squid and octopus are part of the whole cephalopod clade, which is massive and stretches way, way, way back in time. Knowing that, that cephalopods go back in time even further than dinosaurs, they went extinct strangely synchronously in this incredible mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. Why don't we know more about them? Why aren't they reconstructed in uh, animatronic scenes in museums and in Jurassic Park style things? One of the interesting reasons is a bit counterintuitive. It's that they're too abundant. This is a weird problem that cephalopods, and especially the group of coiled cephalopods called ammonites, have faced. They are so super abundant that they're really useful just as geologic timestamps. What that means is that as rocks uh, are uplifted, are laid down in layers with fossils in them, are uplifted, are eroded, different rocks of different ages all around the world will often have the same fossils in them because those animals were living at that time and were fossilized in those rocks. And so if you recognize the animals, it can help to identify the age of the rocks. And for a lot of rock layers, it's cephalopods and ammonites in particular that are super useful as these kind of index fossils or geologic timestamps. And paleontologists have loved ammonites as index fossils for so long that it kind of prevented anyone from thinking about them as living animals. They were just such useful little rocks. And then at the same time, when you look at the fossils, even though they're super abundant, they don't tell you very much about the animals that lived inside. If you look at a skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus or Diplodocus or anything, it's pretty easy to visualize the, I thought I would come down here for a moment. Can you see me better now? A little bit, but I feel very short, so I'm going to do this again. If you look at the fossil of a dinosaur, like a T. rex or a Diplodocus, you can hang the animal on it very easily. You can see where the muscles and the skin and the sinew would have connected the bones together. You can see its jaw, and you can articulate its jaw, and you don't get any of that out of most cephalopod fossils. They're, they're mute. They're just beautifully coiled rocks, and we don't know how many tentacles they had. We don't know where their mouths sat. We don't know whether they had big siphons or small siphons, how they swam, any of that stuff. It's a total mystery just from looking at the externalities of these fossils. And so for a long time, they were beautiful, useful rocks, not living animals. And I think that really the beginning of the change, the, the early roots of the cephalopod renaissance that I'm trying to roll ahead, came in 2001 with the publication of this little book called Ammonites. Um, from a, it, it was part of a series uh, published by the, the London Museum of Natural History, I believe. 
And the authors were trying to challenge this view of Ammonites as rocks. They were trying to say, look, how might they have lived? What clues can we glean from looking at the fossils to make guesses about where they swam, how fast they swam, where in the food web they might have found themselves? Um, and it really, I think, catalyzed a lot of new thinking about the animals. And then in the years since then, there have been a lot more papers published with figures like this, where the animals are actually reconstructed. Um, this and and different ideas, hypotheses are put forward. Why were their shells shaped the way they were? Well, this is a uh, ammonite that had a nice little coiled shell as a juvenile, then it turns straight, and then as a mature adult, it hooks back on itself, sort of like a paper clip. Um, and this was a, a publication um, in 2017 suggesting maybe they actually used that hook to become sedentary breeding adults. They hooked on to kelp. Um, you know, and then a bunch of people published rebuttals to that, and it became a very fiery field, which I think is great for figuring out what's really going on. Um, here was another idea for a not exact, not quite as sharply curved, but still oddly curved shell. And these guys were suggesting that maybe the animal normally swims like this with its head down there, but if it needs to escape a predator, it pulls its body back into the shell, and the shifting weight of its body would cause the shell to rock back so that it escapes its predator that way. So theories, theories, theories abound, um, but at least everyone's talking about it, drawing pictures about it, trying to figure out what's going on. And not only are people thinking about it differently now, but there are new tools and new, new techniques for studying these fossils, um, like CT scanners. I'm told that medical technicians actually love it when paleontologists show up with rocks. They're like, can we put this in your CT scanner? And uh, and everybody gathers around to see what it looks like. Because for a long time, if you wanted to see anything inside one of these fossil shells, to see if it had a radula, to see if it had a beak, to see what might have been in there, you had to break it open. And if you're breaking open a fossil, you're just as likely to damage the things you're looking for as to get an actual clear view of them. But the better and better that scanners get, the easier it is to see what's inside and reconstruct it taking metaphorical slices and not doing any damage to the original fossil. And so this is a, a baculite. It's one of those ammonites that actually re-evolved a straight shell. So this evolved from coiled ancestors. They were super abundant in the late Cretaceous, around the same time as the, the heyday of a lot of the most famous dinosaurs. And nobody really knew what they were doing. They were just these sort of exclamation point shaped creatures somewhere in the ocean. Lots of marine reptiles were eating them, but what were they eating? Nobody knew until um, a scientist named Isabel Cruda and her team put some of them in a CT scanner, and they were actually able to reconstruct the entire shape of the radula, as well as some little bits of its last meal that were trapped in it. I know this is a very, um, it's sort of a complex figure, but here's the, the a fragment of the shell, of the baculite, straight shell. Um, this is a vision through it of where the radula might have been sitting along with jaws. And then this here, if you jump over here, you'll see this is meant to be the jaw. They had sort of a shovel-like jaw around the radula. And this here is this radula, which zoomed in here, had an incredibly complex shape. It's thought that it unfolded almost like a web for catching particulate matter and plankton. So these were almost certainly planktivores. They were not going down to the bottom and picking up detritus, nor were they active predators. They were feeding on drifting plankton, which is a whole new view for these animals. Um, this got published in Science in 2011. And it was followed up by a lot of other studies of different species, what were they eating, where were they living. And there's been so much cool research in the last 10 or 20 years on all of these fossil cephalopods that this ancient book from 1996 has had to be updated. Um, this ammonoid paleobiology is called the Red Book by all of the paleontologists in the field because it's just this iconic, like that's where you go for whatever basic information you need about ammonoids. And when it got revised uh, in 2015, it became two volumes, which fortunately are all available digitally because I don't know how I would put them on my desk anywhere. Uh, and what I love in this new edition, the author, well, the editors wrote to introduce it. They wrote, 
Imagine you belong to any religion and your chief deity asks you, could you imagine editing the new sacred book? This is the feeling you have as an aminoid worker when you are offered to take care of the new edition of aminoid paleontology. Paleobiology. So <laughs> this, is, this was a big deal for the field of cephalopod paleontology. Um, and I found as I was writing a book, trying to coalesce all these ideas about cephalopods as the new dinosaurs, cephalopods as at heart something that arose out of a buoyant shell and over time evolved so far away from that that we hardly even know them for it today. Um, this was kind of my go-to source. And so just like a lot of stuff in this old red book went into the re-envisioning of ammonites that happened in this book, I kind of think of this tome as being the academic backbone that I hung a lot of the research in my book on, the, the Squid Empire book. Um, and it's just, it's so cool to see that these animals that have been around for 500 million years are being studied so actively today that every, every month while I was writing the book, there were new papers coming out. And I'd have to decide, am I gonna incorporate this into it or do I have to let it go for the next edition for whatever it is? And at the same time, all of the living cephalopods, all of our squid and octopus and cuttlefish are also doing really cool and interesting things. So I had to work that into it too. In particular, just in 2016, there was this great meta-analysis from fisheries and scientific survey data showing that all cephalopods, pretty much across the board, benthic, pelagic, benthopelagic, depend, doesn't matter what their life cycle is, whether they're cuttlefish, octopus, or squid, they're all trending up, up, up. Um, this is amazing, this global proliferation of cephalopods. And there are a number of ideas behind it. Uh, certainly it was something that I experienced when I was in graduate school. We were studying Humboldt squid, my whole lab was, and we were, everybody was asking us about the squid invasion because Humboldt squid were coming up the coast and being found in places they'd never been seen before. Um, and it's, they're a very, the whole group of cephalopods really, not just Humboldt squid, are a very volatile resource. They'll, they'll be a boom year for California market squid and then a bust year. And, it's so, and it doesn't travel in predictable cycles. And that unpredictability, in a way, seems to be at the core of their success because they're so flexible. They reproduce so quickly. Most of them live less than a year. Most um, commercial squid and octopus fisheries are for animals that live for less than a year. And they produce so many babies that they can just take advantage of whatever change there is. They can adapt to whatever change in the environment there is, move, move themselves physically in the case of migratory species, or just um, with this rapid generational turnover, adapt on a more, on a deeper level to whatever is going on. And this, again, is the sort of headline and story that people just love to hear about. And so now you can buy t-shirts that say, welcome, Squid Overlord. Um, I didn't wear mine, but, uh, but people love it. And and then, like, once this gets a lot of traction, there's always a bit of concern. Are we going to think they're doing so well that we're just going to eat them all out of the oceans and then regret it afterwards? And it also bears mentioning that this study on cephalopods studied only the shellless cephalopods, the cuttlefish, octopus, and squid. And we do still have those cephalopods with external shells, pearly nautilus. Um, which I think of as why we can't have nice things anymore, because they are really incredible animals. Even just seeing them, if you've ever seen them live in an aquarium display, they're so weird. They're really bad at swimming. Um, like two separate paleontologists that I spoke to for my book, unasked, made fun of nautiluses for their swimming ability, um, because they're just they just bump into things all of the time. And it turns out that's fine. They don't need to swim really well because they are scavengers. They eat not only dead animals, but mostly the shells of dead animals. So a huge part of their diet are the cast off lobster exuvia because they need the calcium for building their shell. And they move so slowly and they grow so slowly that they don't really need much else. Uh, so they're, they kind of have their own weird little niche carved out. Um, they have, their eyes are not as sophisticated they don't have 
lenses and the sort of image forming capabilities that other cephalopod eyes do. However, they have dozens and dozens of tentacles, and what those tentacles can do is still a huge open question. They seem to depend a lot on chemosensory abilities, and we humans are much more visual than chemosensory, and so it's much harder for us to ask questions about and study animals that depend so much on their chemical sensory abilities. So we don't really know what they're capable of. They were thought for a long time to be much less intelligent than squid and octopuses, but recent research has shown that they can form short-term and long-term memories. They can learn to associate a flashing light with food. So there's really still a lot to be understood about them, especially given that their lineage goes back in time. They these nautiluses or nautiloids split off from the rest of the cephalopods 300 million years ago. The exact date is still up for debate, but, um, but there's, by comparing what they can do and how they do it with the rest of modern cephalopods, there's a lot to be learned. Unfortunately, um, the shells are very beautiful and people like to collect them and you can just buy them online for really cheap and the trade was until very recently completely unregulated. So there was no protection for these animals. There was no regulation of how many shells could be imported, tracking who's importing them, who's catching them, how many are they catching, um, until very, very recently. So while uh, my book was going to press, the CITES, the, uh, which is the same international treaty that protects elephants and rhinos and a lot of the big name endangered species, voted in 2016 to also protect Nautilus. And so that means that there's a, now an oversight of the Nautilus trade. It's not, um, it's not like saying we can't collect them anymore. It's just that now there's a burden of proof to show that the collection is sustainable. Um, and there are groups working with the fishermen trying to figure that out. How many are there? How many can we collect sustainably? And then even more recently, um, just at the end of 2017, NOAA proposed, and the proposal is now under review, to have them listed, to have the Pearly Nautilus listed on the Endangered Species Act in the US, which would be protection closer to home. That would mean monitoring all of the shells that come in, how many are there, and who has them, and how much they can be how, how many they can be captured and so forth. So this stuff is all happening right now, um, which makes it a really exciting time to be writing about, communicating about, and studying these creatures because there's all of this research on the ancient ones coming out, kicking off the cephalopod renaissance, I like to think, and then there's all of the cool stuff that the living ones are doing in their global proliferation in the face of changing oceans where they seem to be often the winners um, as oceans are changing. And then there's cool stuff that people are doing to protect the ones that need it. Um, and so given like all of the stuff that's going on, uh, I, I did an experiment actually back in graduate school. I started a blog called Squid a Day to see if I could write something of general interest every day about squid uh, once I felt like there was enough research coming out and I actually had a handle on it. And it turns out that I could. Um, I didn't necessarily have time to do so, but I did actually find something interesting to write about every day. There were often news articles that I was either able to refute because they were ridiculous or substantiate if there was actually some scientific evidence behind them. Or there were, one of my favorite things is there were often really obscure scientific studies being published that I was able to write about on my blog that mainstream news journalistic outlets were not interested in covering. Um, and one of these, I think, is still one of my greatest science communication triumphs. Um, a friend of mine sent me a link to a paper on PubMed called Penetration of the Oral Mucosa by Parasite-like Sperm Bags of Squid, a case report in a Korean woman, which is not like initially something you really want to read more about, <laughs> but I did. And, uh, and I was like, the world has to know about this. It turns out that they're actually uh, 17 documented cases in the medical literature of people eating not fully cooked squid, n neither cooked nor cleaned. And so if they're males, they still have all of their spermatophores inside. If they're females, they still have the eggs inside, but that's not really a problem. But the spermatophores are little packages of sperm that male squid have that, um, that ejaculate independently. And when they do that, ideally, they uh, attach themselves to the 
skin of a female squid, and when she's ready to lay her eggs, she uses them. So she, they cut sort of like little hitchhikers that she brings along with her until she's ready to fertilize her eggs. But if it happens inside your mouth, then the ejaculating spermatophores just sort of attach themselves to all of the oral mucosa, which apparently is very painful. Uh, and then you go to the doctor and have them removed. So she's fine. Everybody's fine that this has ever happened to. Uh, the squid are not fine, but they were going to be eaten anyway. And I thought this is a really useful story for people to hear about. So I wrote a, a blog post, that squid on your plate could inseminate your mouth. And the internet went nuts. Uh, it was just racking up page views. And then, of course, at that point, everybody did want to write about it. And um, io9, which is a great, uh, a, a great blog journalism website. They write about science and science fiction. And they wrote, cooked squid inseminates woman's tongue, cheek, and gums, which is not wrong. I think inseminate is an acceptable term to describe this phenomenon. Uh, and then um, and one of my favorite authors, Neil Gaiman, who wrote American Gods and a bunch of other good stuff, tweeted about it. And it was like, this, I have arrived. I've published this story, and I got Neil Gaiman to tweet about it. Is there a polite way to warn people that cooked squid can still have sex with their mouths? Probably not. Beware. Um, and then uh, a news outlet of dubious quality, the Daily Mail, wrote this headline, uh, woman becomes <laughs> pregnant in the mouth with baby squid, which is not true at all. So then I felt like I had to write another blog post. <laughs> I got pregnant from eating squid. And at this point, I had achieved sufficient notoriety as the person who writes about squid sperm that uh, the editors at io9 actually invited me to write an explainer for them, um, which had a lot of really cool science in it about how the spermatophore packages work. Uh, it turns out that there's, there was still a lot of unknowns. And there was a researcher, um, researcher in South America that I got to interview for this who's been doing these cool high-speed photos trying to figure out how the, the spermatophore packages attached to female squid, um, you know, whether that interaction is beneficial all of the time or if, it's, if it comes with an opportunity cost, like how the biomechanics of the whole thing, all this stuff. So it was very cool. I got to, to learn more about it myself uh, as a result of this story. Uh, and I still actually am known in certain circles as the person who writes about squid sperm. But then I, I managed to fix that a little bit by also writing about squid eggs. When, uh, when something else happened, which was not something that I started, uh, this is an interesting thing. Like Sometimes if you're really lucky, you'll find an obscure journal article and everybody will love it. Um, but other times, there's something already out there that everybody is going crazy about that it's nice as a scientist to be able to explain. Um, that's already, in this case, uh, it was a video of squid eggs that was being called a mysterious giant ocean blob. And very little gets more attention than mysterious giant ocean blobs on the internet, you know, maybe cats. Uh, but people love it, and they're like, we don't know what it is. It's probably a monster, and it's probably going to kill us. Uh, and it was, but, it, but the video is actually quite beautiful. It's these divers off Turkey who found this, this egg mass. They didn't know it was an egg mass. Um, but everybody was watching it and commenting on it. It had over 200,000 views, probably a lot more by now. And one of the really neat things about this is that people were talking about it on Twitter. And there are enough scientists on Twitter that within hours, the thing was identified as a squid egg mass, not just a squid egg mass, but an omastrephid squid egg mass, which is the same group of squid that has Humboldt squid in it. And I wasn't even the first scientist to chime in. I was probably the fourth or fifth, which was really cool. And then I realized that people were still confused. We'd identified it. We told them what it was. But it was still such a weird thing. How could a squid make this? Where are the baby squid? Why are they so small? Why is the mass so big? Is it all one squid? And so I thought, OK, here's a good opportunity to do an explainer. Um, and this time I decided to try doing it visually. So I made an animated video, but I don't actually know how to do animation, so I just filmed myself drawing pictures, uh, which works really well. And then all you have to do is draw pictures. And I drew pictures of the squid and our whole theory of how, where the eggs come from, 
how they mix with jelly from different glands, how that gets extruded and mixed with sperm to be fertilized. And you know what I loved about it is that this was something that I had been talking about since I was a graduate student because we found, when, when I was in grad school, we found the first Humboldt squid egg mass that anyone had ever described. And actually the first scientific paper that I published was about that egg mass. It was a huge part of my thesis. But it wasn't until years later that I drew this explainer that I was able to really put all of the pieces together in my head visually to be like, this is how we think it happens from squid to egg mass. Um, and so I, I still, love this experience. It was educational for me as well as being, I think, educational for a lot of people. Um, it didn't get quite as many views as the original video, but it's still definitely more people than read my thesis. <laughs> Guaranteed. Uh, so, and I'd like to do more videos like this. I think it's a great way to, to get information out there um, and to sort of stretch my own science communication skills. And with that, um, I think I will just let you know that if you're interested in seeing all of the other bizarre things that I have done and plan to do in the future, I have a website called The Cephalopodiatrist, which is very easy to pronounce. Um, and I'm also on Twitter under my own name, which is much easier to find me at. And I wrote a book. Did I tell you I wrote a book? <laughs> it's called Squid Empire, The Rise and Fall of the Cephalopods. You can find it in all fine bookstores that, that carry books, as well as Amazon. Um, <laughs> Of course, and, <laughs> and I only live in San Jose, so you can have me sign it the next time I'm driving through town. And with that, I think I would like to take some questions, and thank you again for having me. of it is done with calculations of buoyancy based on the size of the, the chambers. And then also, um, especially the long straight ones, very often the first chambers, like the, the earliest chambers from when it was a baby, get backfilled. So they actually don't have gas in them anymore, wouldn't have had gas in them anymore. And so that calculating that is why we think that instead of floating around like these big exclamation points, they probably were on their side. Like that was the weight of those backfilled chambers was offsetting the weight of the body over here. So you can do sort of calculations based on that. And then also, um, this is more for smaller animals, but you could kind of scale it with the big ones. Um, they're working on 3D scanning the fossils and then 3D printing them with materials that can go in a flume. And then you can do hydrodynamic testing of what the water flow around it would have been at different speeds to indicate like what speeds it might have been optimally. Yeah, and then the other side, or one other side of that is ways that paleontologists have of looking at the surrounding sediments as, as well as the surrounding fossils. So the little forams and diatoms and things that get fossilized with it can give an indication of things like where in the water column it lived, mid water, Um, so for the straight chilled ones, I, I think you said it a couple times. Do you say belemnites or belemnites? Because I hear completely different things from I the paleontologists. I have heard and said belemnites for the most part, um, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't stand on that. Okay. I, I, I could be correct. And, and, uh, oh, and, and I would just also add on that, um, because it was very tricky for me to figure out, the belemnites were the much later straight shelled ones. And the early huge ones, even though they look very similar, are a totally different group. So, just for extra confusion. Did you, and you, did you have another question? Uh, yeah, um, following that up. So they're among the first to really become pelagic. Um, is there a noticeable change in their evolutionary trajectory once other animals started to become pelagic? Yes, I'm so glad you asked because that was a part of the story that I didn't really have time to talk about, but it's one of my favorites. Um, basically, once fish happened, everything changed. So in the Silurian, when, when jawed fish first evolved, 
Um, it was really the first time that cephalopods had major competition in that niche, as we understand it. And not only competition, but predation. And that's when we see the evolution from these early straight-shelled forms to, that's when ammonites first, or aminoids technically, first evolved. So the coiling of the shell is thought to be a response to that. It makes them more maneuverable, possibly faster, certainly a little bit harder to grab from a shell-crushing predator. And it's also when coleoids, which is the internally shelled group that is squid and cuttlefish and octopus, it's when their ancestors evolved as well. And so these two trajectories of coiling the shell and internalizing it seem to have been a response to fish and then later marine reptiles as well, and much later marine mammals. <laughs> but, yeah, basically every wave of vertebrate evolution in the ocean seems to have caused all of these repercussions and ripples through the cephalopod evolutionary chain. So it seems to me that you kind of took something like science communication that was an interest and decided to make a career out of it. So this is my you, job. I'm sure that there was a lot of learning <laughs> as you went. So when you decided that you wanted to write a book, how did you go about setting yourself up to do it? Uh, that is also a very interesting question. Um, and I was in a somewhat unusual situation that when I wrote this book, I already had an agent because I also write fiction, unrelated to everything, or perhaps related, I write science fiction. Um, and actually there's a book coming out this year in which I have some essays called Putting the Science in Fiction. And it's a whole bunch of us sort of crossover nerds who really like both science and fiction writing essays about how how we wish fiction would better represent the science that we have. So, um, and so because I write fiction, I had uh, a novel that I had been trying to publish and I had queried an agent with it. And so I had got this agent and she was great because she said, you're already a scientist and a science writer. Um, so if you are still interested in writing a nonfiction book, which was something we had talked about a little bit, why don't you do that first and we'll put your novel manuscript on the shelf because I think I can, because it's hard to sell fiction. <laughs> surprise, um, even with an agent. But she said, I think I can sell your nonfiction pretty quickly because you already sort of have a name for yourself as a scientist and writer. And that was what happened. And, so, and I was really excited to write this book anyway, so I was totally happy to go with that plan. Um, yeah, so that's cool. Mm -hmm. So school is not a profession. <laughs> no, it's a passion for the Do you have a passion for another so I thought, I, I mean, I've been a cephalopod person for most of my life, um, but I love other things. I mean, I love all of the marine invertebrates so much, um, polychaetes and jellies and tunicates and all. Of, I mean, I, I even tolerate a lot of vertebrates, um, especially if they're sort of weird. Um, but they, yeah, and uh, and it's when I when I finished grad school and I went into science writing and science communication, I thought that one of the consequences of that which I was excited about was that I would diversify a lot more and you know maybe I'd be writing stories about astronomy and you know articles about particle physics and I have occasionally written those things but the cephalopods just keep being really interesting um, and now that I have written about them so much people will ask me to like, oh there's a new octopus story will you write it or so we'll see it, it might be a lifetime thing um, another two-part question. So first of all, the pens of squid, how well do they fossilize, if at all? And if they do fossilize enough for us to see anything about past squid, um, what were the soft-bodied cephalopods like before the Cretaceous extinction? Were so good. Yeah, so again, something I didn't have time to talk about. Pe squid pens fossilize fairly well, um, and so do octopus pens. Um, which is interesting to learn that octopuses ever had pens, but it turns out that both of those lineages, so the, the internally shelled cephalopods split pretty early on into the squid lineage and the octopus lineage. Um, the octopus, which is technically called the vampiropod lineage because it includes all of the vampire squid, and the squid lineage includes all the cuttlefish. Um, and at that split, they both still had pretty substantial internal shells or, or gladiuses. And they fossilize pretty well. And so they fossilize well enough that there are all of these early gladius bearing, gladius bearing coleoids that people have been arguing about for decades, whether they belong to squid or octopus. And figuring out which is which is kind of tricky because usually the rest of the soft body does not fossilize very well. Um, 
but the, the evolutionary trajectory was towards reduction of that along both lineages. And in the case of the octopuses, it split into two before it completely reduced. And so there are still some octopus, serrate octopuses have two little rods that are the remains of their gladius. And on the squid side, um, it's retained its chambers in sun. So cuttlefish and ram's horn squid or spirula still actually have internal chambers in their shell. And even squid have, if you section through the tip of the gladius, the tip of the pen, some of them have remnant chambers. They don't have gas in them anymore, but you can see the remnant chambers there. So it's interesting. Thank you so much.